Um, when I was in eighth grade, which is a long time ago, uh, that was in 1990, oh my goodness, 1997. Who is not yet alive? Holy crap, like all of you. Okay, so when I was in eighth grade, uh, my grandmother, um, who I love dearly, she passed away from lung cancer. Um, my grandmother probably was the most strongest and just genuine example of a Christian person that I've, I've ever met uh, pretty much in my entire life um, and maybe a couple, of past, a couple of professors. But I remember the days before she passed um, were very trying times for our family. Um, she was the rock that held our family together. She was the one that encouraged us to know God. She was the one that brought all of us really to faith. She was the one that held everything together, even crazily at the age of 80. And she was slipping and you could tell. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, worse, for someone who's stricken with lung cancer, your lungs start to fail. And all of you take for granted the, the breath that you can breathe um, and, the, and the sound that you can make. But when you're stricken with lung cancer and as the cancer starts to eat away at your lungs, you can't breathe very well. So she had this thing, um, this little apparatus testing. It's basically like a tube. And attached to a tube were these three like cylindrical tubes and each of them had a ball at the bottom. And basically as you, as you blew into the tube or if you sucked air out of it, the pressure that you would blow in would make the balls go up, right? Are you getting it? Like you just blow air into it and then the balls, they rise. Now, if any of you were to do it, if I gave it to any of you, you literally just go like that and all three would go. And if you would like that, not even all that hard, all three would suspend all in the midair. It wasn't that even that hard. My grandmother at this stage uh, in her cancer, a few days before she passed, she could barely get the first one halfway up the tube. And she had been battling cancer for, I would say, probably months now. She had been doing a lot of chemo and, and a whole lot of radioactive therapy. But basically, the doctors had told us that at this point, she was very, very close to not I mean, she was going to go any, any day now. And so my aunts and all of us, and uh, my dad's the youngest out of six, uh, originally nine, but a few of them passed away, didn't make it past the Japanese and Christmas, all that kind of stuff. Uh, all of us were there in Virginia when, when this was happening. And I remember this one time, a couple of days before my grandmother passed, um, we were in her room and she was in her bed and my aunts and everyone else, they were hysterical. They were, they were going crazy because I think they realized it had really hit them that soon and very soon my grandmother was not going to be around anymore. And they were really having a hard time dealing with it. And I remember sitting there feeling the, the tense nature of what we were all feeling. Our, our entire family was feeling very overwhelmed, very tattered, very scattered. Like we didn't know what to do, very scared at what was going to come up next. We didn't know how our family was going to go. We didn't know what our life was going to be like without her. She had always held us together. And I remember we were sitting there feeling this way, just feeling disoriented in all these things. And all of a sudden, as we're sitting there crying, she, in her sick bed, mustered up the strength and the energy and then she kind of raised her hand and everyone just kind of stopped. And a lady who could barely breathe, I remember, she then began to speak to us and more so pray for us. And I'll never, and I'll never ever forget what she said. She said, it's not important that I'm leaving you. What's important is what you're going to do once I leave you. And she said, don't ever be sad for me because I'm going to a place where I can dance and be with God. I no longer will have this body. I will be perfected. And I'm going to be with God forever. The question is, is, are you going to join me when your time comes? And I remember my aunts and other people were going crazy. They're like, what are you talking about? Are you saying you're going to die right now? And she's like, no, when I do and when God calls me home, you should not be sad for me. I will be sad for you, but not the other way around. And I remember listening and sitting there trying to take it all in and understanding what was going on. And I realized that my grandmother was giving us her heart. And that, that it happens when you're close to knowing that you're no longer going to be around. The, the heart of who you are, the core of who you are, it gets to you. And she knew, and I think interestingly, even though she was the one who was going to face death very imminently, I think she realized that we were all, all of us, not her, or were much more overwhelmed and tattered and scattered than she was. And she needed to pray for us. And because she's the woman that she was, she prayed for us. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, but these days with the way the world is happening and with just the way that our lives are happening, there's so many times, it seems like weekly throughout the week, throughout the months, in which I feel this way. I feel overwhelmed. I feel scattered. I feel disoriented. I feel like I'm just in need of perspective, need of something to tell me that things are going to be okay, to ground me in something because everything around me seems to be going haywire. And in those times, which seems almost like daily for some the place that I turn to in scripture is the place that we're going to be sitting in for the next four weeks. And that's John 17. A prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples. 
to his father. And the reason why this is the passage, this is the prayer that I go to is because in this text, in this passage, is where you hear most clearly what's at the heart of who Jesus is, what he is all about. You get to the core of what the universe is all about, what it centers on, what it really runs on, is you find this in this text, in this prayer. This is where you find perspective. And the reason why this is because when Jesus was himself feeling overwhelmed, because you remember, he's about to go to the cross very soon. And when he knows that all of his disciples are feeling in the same way, what he does is he reaches down after he's finished, but just about everything, he looks up to the heavens and he says, Father, and he prays. And he uses that term Father six times in this prayer over and over and over again. So for the next four weeks, as you come into this place, feeling however it is that you're feeling, I encourage you and invite you to come into this place to simply listen to Jesus pray. Listen to him pray to his Father. Listen to him pray for his disciples. And listen to him pray for us. In the next four weeks, you're not going to hear me one time tell you to do anything. You're not going to hear me say, go home and do this. Work this out. The only thing you're going to hear me is to say, listen to Jesus, our God, pray for us and the world. Okay? So to do this, let's go ahead and read the prayer first. And throughout the next four, uh, four weeks, you're going to hear other people read this other than me. But today I will read it for you. And then we will go and just d- dive into this prayer for the next four weeks. And hopefully this will be a space in which you will hear our God pray and hear what's really at the core of his heart. John 17 verses 1 through 26. It's a bit long, but bear with us. Jesus then spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, The hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Even as you gave him all authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you for the words which you gave me I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that they came forth from you and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, do not ask, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but those whom you have given to me for they are yours and all things that are mine are yours and you are mine and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And yet while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name which you have given me, and I guarded them out of the one. Uh, Not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you and these Uh, known you that you have sent me and I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me and then we're going to jump in. Father, would you help us to know this prayer? Would you help us to know you in this prayer as well? And Father, wherever we are at, we pray that we would join here together and more than anything else, we would hear you pray. And in hearing you pray, We would be challenged, encouraged, comforted, and we would hear you, O God, above all else in this place, we pray. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I look at this prayer, I find it amazing that Jesus is praying it in a way where the disciples can actually hear him pray. Like, did you ever think about that for a second? I don't know if you've had anyone pray for you in this kind of a way, but when someone prays for you, it's kind of a cool thing. And I know all of your parents, uh, for those of you who have uh, parents who go to this church or a Christian, I know that they pray for you, but rarely, I don't know about you, but they rarely you don't ever get to hear them pray for you, right? They always come to say, because maybe early morning prayer and they'll pray for the, uh, you in private, but rarely do they ever pray for you. But in this instance, for whatever reason, and we'll find out why, Jesus prays for his disciples where they can hear him. And if you know anything about Jesus, you know that Jesus is a guy who prays a lot. He does a lot of praying, but most of the time when he prays, particularly to his father, what does he do? He goes away into a secret spot and then he prays to God, his father, in the private place. But in this instance in this setting Jesus opens his mouth and prays and all of his disciples are sitting around him and they can hear right later when he goes and when they're in the garden and it's at night Jesus draws away to himself to pray but here Jesus wants to make sure that his disciples can hear his prayer so then you wonder why is it that Jesus wants his disciples and us therefore to hear this prayer right One, I think the reason why Jesus wants to hear his prayer is because he wants to tell us what's at the core of his heart. He wants to reveal to us what's most intimate and deep in himself. He wants us to know who he is, why he is, what makes him tick, what he lives for, what he dies for, exactly who he is. And there's no place that he does that more so than in prayer with his father. And I think one of the reasons why he does this is because in uh, John 15, which we looked at a little while ago in the vine and the, uh, that passage, he calls us his friends. And he says, well, now that you are my friends, you know what I'm all about. You're no longer just my servants. I make known to you what the Father is about and who I'm about. So Jesus wants them to know who he is. And it makes sense because he's about to leave them, right? If you remember the context, Jesus has been in the upper room. They had the Passover. He's been washing their feet. And he just told them that I'm going to leave the world. I'm leaving you. You've been with me for three years, but I got to go. And I'm not going to be with you anymore. So to encourage them and to help them to know, he tells them what's on his heart. And I think this is what my grandmother was doing in that room. She needed for us to know what she was all about. So that's what we remember. That's what we would live by. And that's what we would hold on to. And I think Jesus is doing that for us in this passage. Secondly, I think the reason why Jesus tells us uh, and wants us to hear this prayer is so that we will know and we know now that Jesus right now is praying for us. Scripture tells us that Jesus intercedes. That's a fancy word for praying, right? He intercedes on our behalf through and through. And this prayer, if we understand it, we will know what Jesus is praying for us now. What Jesus wants most for us is what he prays for us. And what he's praying for us now is the same thing he prayed for the disciples back in the upper room in Jerusalem. And thirdly, I think he wants us to hear the prayer because he wants us to invite us into his heart. As he said before in John 15, that we would abide, make home in his word. And particularly the word that he speaks now is the prayer. And I think he wants all of us to literally be living inside this prayer, to find ourselves inside this prayer. And as I told you, whenever I need to feel and I need to feel some perspective and need to regain focus and just need to feel a sense of calm and foundation. This is where I live. This prayer is where I sit. And I think the more you sit and live in anything, that prayer becomes your heartbeat. It's like anytime you listen to a piece of music over and over and over again, guess what happens? It gets stuck in your head and you start repeating it. This week, the, the Thomas song, dun, 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 like it just, it just reverberates like it's like some drug and I need to get out of it because Mason and Connor got this new book that plays the thing and they play it incessantly all day and I want to just throw it away and burn it because it just, you know, like the, that's what you want to do. The more you live in something, the more it becomes who you are. The more you feel it becoming the heartbeat of who you are. And I think Jesus is inviting us to live in the prayer to say, this is where you want to be. At the core of who I am, this is where you want to be. So for the next four weeks, as I said before, I invite you to come into this space. Prepare your hearts, whatever you need to do outside of it, but come into this place to listen, to hear, and to sit at the heart of who Jesus is. In some ways, if you want to visualize it, it's like putting your head next to Jesus' chest on his heart and feeling and hearing and hearing and living out the beat of his heart, the drumbeat of his soul and what he's praying for us, okay? And so as we dive in today, I want to do one very important thing. I want to ask in this prayer, what is Jesus asking? And I use that word very, very purposely. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, uh, we had this thing where 
um, they taught you how to pray. And when they taught you how to pray, uh, we had this thing where for a little while, all you ever did when you prayed was you asked God for something. God, could you do this? God, I pray that you would do this. God, you would pray to do this. And then because we're humans and we're sinful, uh, after a little while, people realize, like, that's not what prayer is all about. So you shouldn't ask at all in your prayer. And then people that realize that you, you know, or we had this thing called like ACTS. You had this acronym, like, and you had like a, like a formula. Like, you know, when you prayed, you prayed by doing this and then you couldn't ask for stuff until you already had said things and you had already said, God, you are awesome and da, da, da. But more than that, I think prayer can mean a lot of different things. But in this prayer specifically, Jesus is asking for something. He says it in verse 9, verse 15, and verse 20. He says, I ask of you, Father. And the word that he uses, the word that John uses to capture this word is the Greek word erotau, which is kind of funny. But the word that he uses is a very, very strong word. It's the word that people use when they're interrogating somebody. It's a word that people would use if, you know, if you got caught, let's say you were doing something crazy and you got brought into jail and they were questioning you, interrogating you. If you watch crime shows like my wife does, uh, Christina does, that, you know, you can sit in that room with a glass or whatever and they're interrogating you. That's the word that they would use. And interestingly, with this word in all the Bible, it is never once used of a human being asking God for something because that would be way out of line. Because it has this nature of like demanding, like belittling, like getting in your face with a lot of intensity. Like, what did you do? Give me what I want. That kind of a nature. But Jesus can do this to God because Jesus is equal to God as we learn in Philippians 2 and a lot of other things. So this prayer, Jesus is intently with boldness and lots of energy and fervor. He's asking God for something he really, really, really wants. And so the thing that I want to ask is what is Jesus Asking, what does he want in this prayer? What is he after? What's the whole prayer surrounded on? Who is he and what is he after? And the more and more I look at this, and this is, I think, where you need to hear this. What Jesus wants in this prayer is he wants nothing from us. He only wants something from God for us. This prayer that Jesus prays before he leaves the disciples, amazingly, at least in my opinion, he's asking nothing of the disciples. He's not telling them to do a single thing. See, when Jesus prays for us, what Jesus does is he doesn't say, hey, you, Peter Chung, do this, do this, do this. I want you to do this. I want you to follow this. I want you to be here. I want you to be there. He goes and he speaks to his father and he demands almost. He interrogates almost. He he just asks deeply to his father to say, can you do this for them? Father, do this for them. He's not asking anything from us. He's praying to God for us. And I don't know, I don't know if the, how, this in, how this rings with you, but to imagine that the God of the universe, the one who comes down from heaven into the earth as the way he does, the one who goes to the cross is sitting there pleading on our behalf to God the Father asking him to do only what he could do. And I look at that and I feel so overwhelmed and and just comforted. That's why I come back to this passage and again and again. Because when I don't know what to do with the world, when I don't know what to do with my life, when I'm feeling overwhelmed and scattered, and I don't know if you ever feel that way, maybe you do. I want to go to a place where I know I don't have to do anything but to listen. And Jesus does all the work and he asks God to do all the work. That's just awesome that God would want from me. Nothing from me, but for me from God. So what is Jesus asking God, his father, for us then? Well, let's go back into the situation a little bit, okay? As I told you before, what's happening here? Jesus has come into Jerusalem. He knows he's going to be crucified soon. So they go into the upper room and they have that Passover feast. And if you remember, there was no lamb. Remember a while back, we talked about it. There was no lamb. Jesus was telling them, I'm the lamb. I'm going to be sacrificed. And then he washes their feet. And then he tells them, I'm going to leave. I'm going to die. And, I'm, and at this point, Jesus is kind of setting the stage. And the stage is not really good, right? There's a lot of uncertainties, a lot of uncomfortableness. There's a lot of just kind of tension in the room, right? The disciples are trying to make sense of what's going to happen. They're, they know that he's going to leave. He's talked to them about abiding, making home, remaining, and doing all these things. And then he gets to the prayer, knowing that, the, that death is coming, knowing, and he, I think himself, Jesus is feeling a bit overwhelmed, right? Later he goes, Father, if you will, if it's your will, take this cup from me. It's not like Jesus just wants overwhelmingly with joy to like die on the cross, but he knows he needs to. And so feeling in this tense environment, he goes and he prays, right? 
and he says what's on his heart. Because that's what happens. I don't know about you. If you ever encounter somebody who's near death, what they say in the moments before they pass is probably clearly most what's at their heart and who they are. Because you don't have time to pretend anymore, right? You've got to get to the heart of who you are. And so the, the deepest desires of Jesus' heart becomes crystal clear in this passage. And in verse 1, he lays it out from the beginning. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. This, that idea of glorifying, of glory, is the driving beat of this entire prayer. It's the thing that Jesus wants more than anything else. You hear it in verse 5, or verse 4, excuse me, verse 5, and even verse 24. It's glory, glorify, glorify me so I can glorify you. Glorify you, I have been glorified, God be glorified. And so I ask, what does it mean to be glorified or what does it mean to have glory? Well, the Greek word for glory is this word called doxa. Okay. And this word, wherever you see it in the Bible, it has three kind of different meanings or three kind of hints or leanings. Okay. One of them is about illuminating. The word for glory is associated with illuminating anything. What does that mean? Anyone know what it means to illuminate something? It's very simple. It's bringing light to something, right? So what happens when you illuminate something? It brightens up. You can see it better. It becomes more clear. So in many ways, what Jesus is saying is, Father, right, illuminate or shine your light on your son so that the son may illuminate or shine your light on you. Another leaning towards the word for glory or doxa is weightiness, for something to be weighty, heavy, for it to have consequence, for it to matter, right? And so what Jesus might be praying here is that Jesus might be praying, you know what, Father, make your son have consequence, have weight, be heavy, so that the son can make you carry weight, be heavy, have consequence, and for you to matter. The third main also then leaning of the word doxa also means the essence. The core, the core of who you are, the essence and the essence of the being, right? And so what Jesus might be praying then is also then, Father, make the very core and the essence of you be known so that I can make you and your essence be known. So Daryl Johnson defines glory this way. He says, glory is, and the meaning of glory or to glorify is to honor the essence of something or to manifest slash reveal the essence of something. Basically, the word to glorify, if I were to say I want to glorify Brian, I want Brian's essence at the core of who he is, the very nature and everything about who he is, to be manifested, revealed, illuminated, for it to matter, for it to be known. And so what Jesus is praying in this prayer is very simple. He says, Father, the hour has come. Honor me so that I may honor you. Or manifest my essence so that I may manifest your essence. Now, the word for hour in Greek, or the word for hour in the book of John is a very interesting thing. If you trace it back throughout the gospel of John, you'll notice that it means kind of two things. Whenever Jesus talks about the hour, he's talking about two things. One is the hour at which he's going to be revealed. Do you remember the uh, wedding one when he's at the wedding and his mom's like, hey, can you make more wine? Do you remember what he says to her? He says, woman, my hour has not come. He's basically saying the time to know who I am and what I'm about is not here yet. Chill out for a second. The other, if you trace it back, the other time the word for the hour is used in the Gospel of John, you'll find that the hour is when men, violent men, are going to try to seize him and basically take him and kill him. So in the Gospel of John, whenever, whenever the hour is spoken about, it means that one, people are going to try to come and get Jesus and kill him. And the other time, and the other meaning, is that he's going to be the most manifested or most known or most glorified. And somehow these two go together. And so Jesus then in this prayer, he prays, Father, the time has come. The time has come, so honor me so that I may honor you. Manifest or reveal me and my essence so that I can reveal your essence. The thing that drives Jesus and the thing that he lives and dies for, and you need to hear this, is that we and he would be known. The thing that makes Jesus tick is that God would be made known to all the world and nothing else. That at the core of who he is, is that he wants God to be known in the world. That we would know who God is. And this is why I've said in here many, many, many times. If you do not know who God is, it matters not what you do. Nothing in this book will make sense to you if you have not gotten a grip on the essence and the core of who Jesus is really is and who God is. 
Remember, our job and our main job isn't to love others, isn't to do good things, is to make our home in Jesus and his home in us. Because when we know God most, when we know at the core of who he is, the essence of who he is, then everything else makes sense. Everything else falls in line. Which is why then in verse four, Jesus says, I've glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you've given me. He's basically, I did everything you asked me to do. I've made you know now. Well, people should know by now who you are. Because every sign, every miracle, every parable, everything that Jesus has done up to this point, the whole point of it was to do exactly what God wanted him to do. And that is very, in a sense, in his nature to make God known. Which is why in verse 3, if you read it, he says, this is eternal life, right? Everybody wants eternal life. Everybody wants to know what it is. He defines it. He says, this is eternal life. That they, the people, would know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That's what this is all about. Did you know that? Everything you do in here, this entire Christian life, isn't about good things, isn't about all those things. It's about knowing who God is and allowing that to help dictate the rest of your life. Now, when I take this passage and I dig a little deeper, I find a very interesting thing that happens. He says, in the very beginning of the prayer, he says, Father, the hour, the moment, the time has come for me to be violently seized and taken away to die, but at the same time for me to be revealed or most known to the entire world, right? It's time for me, God, Father, to be taken away by evil men who want to kill me and be killed, but at the same time, the, also the time is now for you to be made known more than anything else in the world. Now, if you take, about, if you take those two things, right, it kind of doesn't make any sense, does it? Like, how can one go with the other? right? If I want to know who Brian is most, I'm picking on Brian today. If I want to know who Brian is the most, the thing that I probably least am going to do is to take him and then go murder him on some cross or do something crazy like that, right? That's not the way you want to know who Brian is all about, right? You're probably going to want to know all of his good traits, all the things that he does well, all of his, you know, good, lovely things that, you know, he's got in his heart, all of the ways that he smiles and the things that he loves and the things that he loves to do, how, uh, you know, amazing he is, you know, like all these things. That's what you want. But for Jesus, interestingly, the hour in which he's going to be most made known is the same hour in which he's going to be seized and killed. And so this is what this means. The moment in which Jesus is most glorified, most honored, most revealed, most made known to all of us, the moment in which we know to the core and the very essence and most clearly who Jesus is, is found where? On the cross. Now, just wrap your mind around that for a second. So if anyone asks you, who is Jesus and how do I get to know him? You know what the answer should be? Look at the cross. Now, to put it in perspective, I don't know if you know, but cross is the older version of the electric chair, right? It's an execution thing. You going to the cross means you die. You going to the electric chair means you die. So how is it that when someone asks us, how do we most know and most clearly know who Jesus is, who God is, who is this, this God that you worship, will say, look to the cross. How does that make sense? Right? When Jesus goes to the cross to take on the sins of the world, to free us all from it is the moment in which God is most glorified. What Jesus wants more than anything is that we know who God is. And the God he wants us to know is a God who dies for the sin of the world so that we can live with him. I don't know what you know about God. I don't know what you understand about God. I don't know who you think this God is. If you think this God is about rules and things he wants you to do, being good, being righteous, all those things, you can throw all that out the book because our God from the beginning to the end is a God who wants most 
for us to know him and in knowing him, enjoy the love and the beauty and the dance and the glory that he's been having for, since the beginning of the world. And the only way he does that to a sinful world is to come and to die so that we can join him in that. And that's why when he gets to the cross, he says, God, it is finished. The world will know who I am and who you are. All the glorifying, all the honoring, all the manifesting has been done. Now, are you seeing why this is the text that I come to whenever I need perspective and feeling overwhelmed? Because this is a text, this is the prayer, this is the thing that tells me that our God is the God who self-empties, who sacrifices himself, who desires for us to know him more than anything else. To know him, to love him, to abide in him so that we would make our home in him and he would make his home in us. A God that wants us to see, not do anything for him, but a God that wants us to see and to know that he is a God who will go to any length and any desire, jump over any wall, break any barrier so that we would have life in him. And I don't know about you, I don't know if you any ever will find any one singular person whose heart is driven by the fact that they want you to live more than anything It's not about salvation for God. See, God isn't someone who just wants you to be saved so that he can feel good about himself that you didn't die somewhere. God is a God who wants you to live with him in beauty and in love. That you would know that there's a God out there who wants you as you are. And he will go to every length. And he will say, you want to know who I am? You want to know exactly who I am? I don't know if you've had any friends, right? Or if you've known people and then sometimes your friend that you think you've known for three years or four years or five years or whatever and they go on off and do something and you're like, holy crap, I thought I knew that person. Clearly, I, I know nothing. Jesus is saying, you want to know who I am? You want to know what I'm all about? You want to know exactly how I work and how I operate? Look at the cross because on the cross, you will see that I'm a God who wants you to know me and know that I'm a God who dies for the sin of the world so that you can live. Oh, the prayer that Jesus prays. Not dying isn't enough for Jesus. He wants us to live, to love, to laugh, to dance, as we'll find next week, to have joy, peace, patience, and all that. And he will go to any length to do so because that's what's on his heart. Because he's always been about that dance. He's always been about that love and about that glory, about that true loving relationship. And he wants us to have the same with him forever and ever. If you know that song, Above All, everyone know that song, right? Does everyone know that song, Above All? It's a very uh, cool song. Right? And it's a kind of an emotive song. It says, you know, the lyrics here, I have it. He says, above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all creative things, above all wisdom, above all the ways of man. Basically, above everything, right? You were here before the world began. That's true. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all the wonders the world has ever known, above all the wealth and the treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. True. Crucified. True. Laid behind the stone. Buried. True. You lived to die. True. Rejected and alone in that moment. Yes, true. Although not quite, maybe. Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall, true, and thought of me above all. Not true. He was thinking about his father. And the, and the God his father is. Yes, we are part of that equation because our God cares for us. But this whole thing, in these next four weeks, I invite you to come and listen to a God who wants nothing more than for you to know who he is. And when you know who he is, you will become saved. When you know who he is, you will love, and you will joy, and you will dance. And when you know who he is and see him for who he really is and see his glory, you will fall into more love, fall into salvation, and fall into everything else. This and everything else is always and forever will be all for glory. The glory of the one. Forever and ever. 
And as I invite the praise team back up, I invite you into a place to listen to his words yet again. To hear Jesus pray for you. And if wherever it is you are, however it is you've come to this place, whatever it is that you've heard or did not hear, if there's one thing you hear, I hope and pray that you will go home with this. Whatever it is you think you know about God, if it isn't the fact that he's all about the glory of his son and himself as the God who dies for the sins of the world, then I pray that you would hear God speak to you, to listen to his heart. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. Honor and manifest me, your son, God, so that I may manifest and reveal most strongly and most clearly to all the world who you are. Because when we know who you are, then we will have life. When we know who you are and see who you are, taste who you are, be with you, make home in who you are and who you are, make home in us, then we will be saved, then we will love, then we will laugh, then we will dance, then we will joy, and we will do all these things in you. Oh, Father, may it be in this place, in all of us forevermore, all for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join us as we close in worship?